thank you so much for your very generous, kind introduction, Professor. Um, I'd like to express my joy for being once again here uh, in the city and especially in the university. Um, this is going to be a glimpse of glimpse. Oh. Mm. Abhidharma in a uh, few hours is just not possible. It's mission impossible. <clears throat> Actually, Professor was making a comment, which is quite an important one. He said, why um, generally uh, the Buddhist especially within the Mahayana sphere, and uh, Tibetan Buddhists don't have much of an Abhidharma study, as much as uh, we have like in uh, Madhyamika, Prajnaparamita, which is a very important um, and correct observation. I was actually also talking to Keshila here, reconfirming that, uh, how many years we study, such as in the Garden University, and Keshele uh, correct, uh, you know, confirmed that they study Abhidharma two years, <clears throat> and the Prajna Paramita five years, and uh, Brahmana five years. Um, Probably it has got to do with uh, <clears throat> um, in these um, traditional Buddhist societies, um, those who pursue the Buddhist study. Um, they are mainly sort of practice, you know, they are, they are gearing towards the Buddhist practice, so to speak. Um, so, if you want to become a practitioner, um, then obviously for a practitioner, the view is the most important. So it may be something to do with this, that, well, at least in the, within the Tibetan uh, world. So studies such as uh, Madhyamika and the Prajna Paramita become kind of important because that's where you study view. And uh, Pramana is important because this is where you study how you value the, how you validate the view. So somehow, maybe this is just my guess, somehow the study such as uh, Abhidharma and the Vinaya gets a little bit um, outshined. In fact, I can tell you this, from my personal experience, um, As a, somebody who is recognized as a tulku or a reincarnate, you know, um, we had to go through, at least in my generation, this has changed now. In my, during my generation, we had to study a lot. There was other reasons also, because when I was growing up, um, Tibetan Buddhism was in a very precarious situation. So the older generation, my teachers, they were like, 
they have this sort of anxiety or a, they were very um, worried about you know who will take the next sort of who will take take over the next uh, responsibility so there was just incredible amount of bombardment of you know uh, training but training means a lot which i will speak a little bit later so i was i was sent to philosophy study philo i guess nangden ripa you know like philosophy study for a long time now just like many of the ancient asian especially chinese and the tibetan and especially you know the buddhist so called hindu um there are a lot of people mm, there are a lot of practitioners for instance like my family is a uh both from my father's side and my mother's side they were very 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 strong practitioner and i remember this so well both from bo both my grandfather and especially my father while i was studying buddhist philosophy especially like a pramana buddhist uh, epistemology and uh, and uh, abhidharma and uh, um logic my father would ask what are you studying i would say chema ramana so such a waste of time he said it's a total waste of time and he wasn't joking if i say i'm studying madhyamika or prajna paramita they will not make much comment i mean sometimes even that because this is coming from a practitioner's point of view in their world they believe or they think that spending if you let's say if you have like 3 hours in your life to you know to you know uh study and practice dharma then in their world this is how they think 10 minutes out of this 3 hours you should flip through the philosophical books and study and uh, so on and so forth the rest you should just practice you see so yes i have to say even myself i studied madhyamika a uh, quite a lot prajna paramita and also uh, brahmana the logic or i don't know that the brahmana should be um, translated as a logic <clears throat> but very little abhidharma and the vinaya but i have to qualify this at the same time my tantric gurus the gurus i have studied tantra they have always said you study you should study abhidharma because in the future when you study tantra if you don't know abhidharma half the tantric study you will not understand so actually abhidharma is a very very important study um and now more than ever especially for the buddhist whether you are a academic just academic student or a practitioner i think more than ever we need to study madhyamika because in the madhyamika i think you we really need we really need i mean we really learn about the richness of the study of mind and matter it's um, it's just so rich for instance okay one example is like mental health 
current currently we have a big mental health issues, right? But most, even now, even the modern study, there is no in-depth, even the in, uh, even the identity of what is mental. Forget about health. What is what do we mean by mental? What do we mean by mind? And what do we mean by matter corresponding to mind? So if you, if you really want to study things like mental, mind, value, and, how, and the emotions, neurosis, and the projections, if you want to study the projections, you will be so amazed that the Indian panditas of the past, how much they have really thought through, spent so much time in assessing these things. And it's, a, it's you know, when I was asked to, um, do something here in Pune University, and somehow the Abhidharma ended up becoming the subject. And as I've already told you, I'm not an exp I'm not expert in Abhidharma. I think I may have a little bit more knowledge on Abhidharma. I mean, um, uh, Madhyamika, but not Abhidharma. But after I agreed to do this, I was doing a little bit of study myself. And, um, I don't know whether Sudip is here. Somehow Sudip, one of my friends, who also recommended me to study uh, the French, philo uh, French, I guess, philosopher Roland Barthes, Roland Barthes, right? And it was so good. I, you know, like when I'm reading Roland Barthes and Abhidharma uh, commentaries, this guy should have met Basubandhu. This guy should have met all this great Abhidharma commentator. Because in the Abhidharma, you will learn what makes myth, what makes fact, and how you brainwash others, how you get sucked into brainwashing machine. And really, this is like, we are talking about this kind of study was, is available 2,000 years ago in India. And it is really, what I mean, Indians should really treasure Abhidharma study because it's a, it is now more than ever if the world needs, actually, I just, I read somewhere, I, I forgot the author. I mean, he said the leaders should be a philosopher, at least some part. Part of this, you know, if you want to be a prime minister or president, you know, part of the curriculum should be a, you know, like philosopher. I think it is so true. And in that, something like a subject of Abhidharma would be really, really good. Because it, it really opens your mind and the way you look at the view, I mean, look at the way you view the world. Hopefully I can try to introduce you to some of the term in the next coming hours, days. <clears throat> Um, okay, now, in, I want to tell you this, because I think this is a strategy, I don't like to use the word things like spiritual or secular, because I think this is, this word alone is a very, very deceiving, because it's a, 
the definition of these words are really, really tricky. I want to actually talk about the ancient Indian strategy of life. I think I would rather put it this way. And they have something called, which we, which we in Tibetan, we translate this as a ter sam gom. Ter meaning hearing, basically hearing, gathering information. That's what you are supposed to do, Get, gathering information, reading, hearing, actually literally listening to somebody talking, opinions, you listen. And then, samba is translated in English as a contemplation, but basically assessing, validating, valuing, being critical. Is this good for me? Is it good for my village? Is it good for my country? Is it good for my family? Is it good for the world? So on and so forth. But most importantly, gom, gom, which is very badly translated as a meditation these days. But I think the gom is samadhi, which is basically um, I don't know, I, I like myself thinking samadhi as an act of habituating. You know, basically, you are learning to habituate, right? So this used to, this is a sort of the Indian strategy on how, how to find the goal in your life. You need the hearing, contemplation, and that's just for the sake of easy meditation. And even the hearing, you are supposed to really, really have what we call uh, um, meaning uh, you should really, during the hearing, you are supposed to hear everything. And this existed before in India. If you look at the Indian ancient world is evident. Even structurally speaking, if you go to places like, like Ajanta Elora, there's like a Hindu temple, so-called Hindu temple, there's a Jain temple, there's a Buddhist temple. They, and then they seem to be always like having, you know, like breakfast together, lunch together. I don't know, they seem to be like talking to each other all the time. Of course, they are debating, teasing each other, you know, like, and, but there was also sometimes things, you know, argument gets serious and, you know, things gets really, really hot. There was that situation too. But Indians have always encouraged this open, you know, <clears throat> hearing. And this is a something that is waning now. Just a big example. I was talking to I'm talking to our friends in with uh, friends last night. That just like for instance, India and China, Chinese and Indian, these two incredible civilizations. And you to a neighbor, you cannot just sort of cancel it. It's just a neighbor. You know, you, you have to sit together, right? You cannot really like... But both of them don't have a good hearing. It's lost. Everything about, everything that the Indians know about China is written and talked 2,000 miles away from India. So <laughs> 2,000 miles away from here, somebody writes about Chinese, and then you read here. And the Chinese do the same thing. So they, that power of hearing, that open hearing, is uh, waning. And this is a one, one thing that Indians have encouraged before, and this need to be kept. And I have a lot, of, a lot more things to say about contemplation and uh, meditation, but probably we should get into the, what is it? 
uh, <clears throat> Abhidharma. Um, if we have time, we can talk about it. Okay, so now, because I have been sort of aspiring and in little sort of in in the very limited and little um, capacity, I've been sort of trying to create some education, Buddhist education, so to speak, Buddhist education, um, like, you know, like school for kids. And then, of course, I have I'm running Buddhist education uh, place, like traditional Shedra. Uh, so this is, by the way, related to Abhidharma, okay? <clears throat> so I've been thinking recently what is the Buddhist education system, so to speak? Buddhist education system, or a Buddhist education strategy. Um, I'm sure many of you, those who are old Buddhists here, you know already the term, three baskets. Uh, so, hlapa, the word hlapa, something to do with the education, basically training, basically um, altering, al you know, yeah, hlapa, training, training, training your mind. I mean, training, getting trained. <clears throat> so, Buddha's, all the Buddha's teachings, if you, I mean, it's beyond categorization, actually. But since category, category, category is a one thing that we humans always, I mean, that's something necessary, isn't it? Like we can't do without the category, even though the moment you categorize something, you are doomed already. Because you actually cannot categorize things. But anyway, that's the only way. You know, it's, that's the only way to begin, at least, to comprehend the vastness and the infinite sort of the world. So when we categorize Buddha's teachings, we categorize in three training. And this is actually really, really interesting. There's a, okay, so there's the Lapa Sherab Lapa, which is the training in Buddhist, uh, Buddhist training of Prajna, which is the wisdom. Okay, Prajna. So, what is Prajna? Wisdom. What? What do we mean by prajna? Well, like many ancient Indian, you know, thinking, Buddhist is not different. Prajna is a mind that really knows. It's, it's very difficult to, what do you call it? <clears throat> difficult to... I think translate word prajna, share up in uh, other languages. I mean, we can try. But anyway, for now, prajna is the uh, prajna is the mind that knows the truth. Okay, now this is already not so good. What I just told you is already not so good because. The moment I said, Prajna is the one that knows the truth. 
already it is already deceiving you because it is already asserting that there is the mind and there is the truth this mind does the act or the action of knowing this truth isn't it but to speak in the most profound level especially you know in the beginners level it's very very difficult what i'm basically saying is if we talk about prajna at its highest level knower and known there's no difference that is the prajna but anyway we still need to somehow get close to this truth so anything that buddha's teachings any buddhist teachings buddha's teachings that takes you to that truth falls into this basket of laba sharab ji laba the the training of wisdom and the abhidharma falls into this department actually it actually falls into not only madhyamika not only prajna paramita actually abhidharma falls into that, this department so, so professor is very very right when he said why are you why you guys don't well i'm paraphrase i mean i'm uh, what do you call it dramatizing your word a little bit but they basically professor was saying why why don't you guys study um, madhyamika as much i mean uh, abhidharma as much as madhyamika he's very right this abhidharma falls into the department of uh, the basket of prajna just to quickly finish the three basket what does the th- other two basket do what's the benefit of this okay so the aim is to understand the truth to have the prajna right now how to habituate oh, no how to validate what is truth how do you define the truth how you validate how do you come to a conclusion that this is the truth any teachings that re- takes you to that is called um you know like uh, what do you call um, you know like uh, pramana pramana logic is is pramana logic how do you translate sort of how do you translate pramana yeah but that's but how do you get used to okay once you come to the conclusion that this is the truth ah this is the truth now there's a problem though even though you know it is the truth because the you are, because you still have a billions of habitual patterns that still distracts you from this truth interpret this truth dilutes this truth misinterpret this truth so much i was reading a tantric text on my way here and the in the tantra in this tantric text it says it talks about the the basically talking about the prajna and the mashila and the samadhi and it says like let's say somebody is dreaming and this somebody dreamed that he drank he drank a poison and suddenly he realizes is a poison what do you do if this guy is very smart then the other person or the other person has to ah, turn away you just dreamt cause immediately you relax right oh yeah of course that's just a dream i don't have to worry at all tantra is saying that tantric uh, 
faculty to hear the tantra, it, a faculty or the, yes, faculty to hear the tantric teaching should be as calm and as calm and unpanicky as this person who will think, oh yeah, I dreamt this, I, I have nothing to worry. That's how a tantric student should have that kind of capacity, that kind of calmness. Now, most of us don't even realize, even if somebody is telling you, you are, that's your dream. In fact, many of us, we may get annoyed. You just drank, a, you know, like a kilo of poison and someone tells you, hey, you know, this, don't worry, this is just a dream. And you, you could really get angry about this. Somebody should tell, oh yeah, what a serious thing, let's call ambulance, let's do this, let's do, you prefer to hear that. And then of course, that your friend is a very compassionate, very loving, very caring. He knows that you are taught, you, are, you have gone bananas, so you need to be assisted. And then this person has to bring all kinds of other methods. But, all those methods must lead to understand the truth. And then these methods are basically falls into the department of sutra. Uh, the, uh, I mean, thing is in samadhi, samadhi basket. But samadhi requires the discipline. You know, Habituating oneself to the truth needs a discipline and the art of disciplining. Art of disciplining. You know, please, uh, this time we had a glimpse of um, uh, Abhidharma. Maybe, please, uh, maybe the university could uh, invite some scholar about uh, Vinaya. I don't know how much they could really share this to the general public. But actually, the Vinaya study is one of the most interesting. It is incredibly progressive. It's an incredible art of disciplining. Going back to the example, how do you discipline a man who just dreamt he drank poison? Now, he's not going to hear you saying, hey, that's just a dream. He's not going to get, he's not going to buy that. He would prefer you calling ambulance and all of that. Now, how do you discipline this, this person? You have compassion, you have loving, you care. This is your child, probably. Now you need to formulate, you need to have a formula, right? Discipline formula. And this is where the third basket, the basket of Sheila, and by the way, this tree is how the Buddhist education system works. And, you know, basically education is basically, I'm sorry to say this, in the education center, but Education is kind of a brainwashing, isn't it, basically? But here, you need to brainwash this guy who just dreamt he drank a poison. How do you brainwash this? Especially if he or she doesn't accept that this is just a dream. So, anyway, Three baskets. Lava sutim chilava, lava tingin chilava, lava shedab chilava. Three pitaka, sometimes it's. Uh, hmm? Three shiksha, you're right. Three shiksha, three shiksha. Hmm. And this Abhidharma um, can fall into what is it? Uh, um, shut up, Rajna. 
Okay. Do we have to? When do we? Oh, okay. <clears throat> So, um, I haven't been giving teachings for some time. I've been sort of escaping from this. Uh, so this is the first, sort of first time after a long time talking to. Um, so I'm a little bit, uh, I don't know, disoriented. And um, also, it's kind of, you know, also, mainly I've been, you know, even when I taught before, I was teaching more things like uh, upaya, you know, like uh, methods, sort of, not, not so much um, theory. Um, because um, I think not many people are interested in theory these days. They just want a quick method. Theories <laughs> are not lucrative. <laughs> Methods are very lucrative, right? Especially quick, short, sort of Instagram land or TikTok land. But Abhidharma TikTok land, difficult, <laughs> difficult. <laughs> it's not going to be that easy. Um, anyway, Word a bee. Mm. This is there are a lot of Pali students. Oh, by the way, I, I should mention this. The Abhidhamma is really well preserved by the Theravada tradition. So if you go to places like Burma, Sri Lanka, Thailand, we really need to offer our gratitude and appreciate this because they have preserved this. And um, those who speak Pali and Sanskrit, I'm sure your appreciation level of uh, Abhidharma terms will be much, much more different from the rest of us who don't speak this language. And language is really, really important. Because I think language really, really alters the way people think. Um, so I don't know. And some of you young, modern Indian um, people who are not, in, not so much into Pali or Sanskrit, um, I don't know whether you have the full capacity to appreciate the word abhi. When I'm speaking to you, I'm already speaking um, already, you know, regurgit regurgitated, you know, like Sanskrit, Pali, Tibetan, and now I'm speaking in English. Can you see how much you are losing? Are you sure you should sit here? 
really, really uh, bastardized, you know, definition and approach. The, just the word Abi alone. I don't know how to put this kind of crudely and easy to understand, but let me try this. If you look at the ancient Indian, you know, culture or ancient Indian thinking, you can see they were so obsessed with truth. So obsessed. Everything they do is about it, actually. It's truth. Even the word truth is... Um, <clears throat> what is the word truth in Bali, Professor? Satya? 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 How do you translate that in a... How do you think the truth does the work? Yeah, exactly. But I just wanted to share this with you. So, because I will keep on using the word such as truth. But I want you to really know this. So the word abhi, abhi, in the Tibetan beta, Tibetan translators, I have to say proudly, they really, I mean, some of the Tibetan youth, they actually grumble a bit. They say that basically Tibetans are in this situation all because of Dharma. Kind of true, you know. 95% of the national budget was spent on translating the Dharma. They weren't thinking about foreign affairs, they weren't thinking about defense, they weren't thinking about any of this. You could almost say the Tibetan language was created just to translate the Dharma. Can you believe this? Not just by one king, several, few generations. So I have to say, they have really, really done a good job, I think. Really. And I appreciate this. Um, Few years ago, I was reading Murakami. Haruki Murakami, right? Is it full name Murakami? I, I, there was a phase that I really enjoy reading him. But then, sorry, I'm really wasting so much time, but. I have to say this. But then I uh, read some of the Yasunari Kawabata's book. And that's a totally different, you know. I think the Yasunari Kawabata wrote in a Japanese, so the real Japanese way. And then Murakami, as I'm sure many of you read, you can see the way he wrote. The audience is already westernized. He's talking about the jazz, the Beethoven, the Bach. You can tell he's always quoting Kant, Hegel, this, that. But even then, I was reading um, Japanese uh, the Murakami's Norwegian Wood. I'm sure some of you have read Norwegian Wood. And I was reading this, and then my Japanese translator, Japanese. She told me, Rinpoche, you are missing something like 50% of what he wrote. Then so I challenged her and said, okay, this part, you tell me in your English, in, but in your, with a Japanese mind. And then she sort of retranslated a part. 
And I perceive it's really, really different. Now, that's Murakami. Now, Yasunari Kawabata is much, much more like you can feel that there's a, so much of the Zen, the Japanese sort of wabi sabi, the transient, the beauty of impermanence. So much is lost. I must be. So it's a bit like this, right? So Abhidharma, Madhyamika, Prajanam. But we still need to, I mean, we can still try to get the gist. I mean, try to get the meaning, I'm sure. Especially when the students and the translators, when they become practitioners, I think they will sort of have a lamp somewhere. And hopefully this will come in the future more and more. I think there's already a few, you know, even in English or French, when they, people who have gone through the practice, people who have really, I don't know, approach the text with a different emotion. They translate in a different way. So anyway, what I'm saying is the Tibetan translators have done an amazing job in translating these words, such as abhi, which is in Tibetan, ngan, ngan, ngan. Something to do with towards. Towards. When you think about this, it's so beautiful, isn't it? The word abhi means towards. You are learning. I mean, I'm giving you a glimpse of what is meant by towards. Towards. Think about the word towards. It's an important aspect of our life, you know, towards towards this afternoon, towards lunch, towards the toilet break, towards, you understand? Oh, these are very, very superficial towards, but there are so many other towards. So it, because of this, this, you know, towards what? Towards satya, satya, truth, denba. Oh, I should tell you this. Vipassana has become very, very popular. And it's becoming, you know, people love practicing Vipassana. Now, if you really, really want to learn the engine, the machine of Vipassana, Abhidharma is it. Abhidharma has the, that bolt and, I don't know, everything, engine, the, how it functions. It's in the Abhidharma. Even, okay, <clears throat> okay, so for instance, like a concept of reincarnation, uh, no, uh, renunciation, a renunciation. Generally, when we talk about a renunciation, you can even talk renunciation on the level of Paolo Coelho, right? You know that, what? His first book, what's the name of the first book? Alchemist. You can even talk about that kind of renunciation level too. Paolo Coelho, Brazilian renunciation. Okay, sort of, okay, he has, what? I only read like five pages, so I don't remember. <laughs> like, you know, like, there's something like a code or something like that somewhere, and then he's looking at his sheep, and, you know, you can talk about that kind of renunciation. Renunciation has a many, many different kinds. But when the Buddhists talk about a renunciation, It's altogether a different matter. We are not only talking about, oh, things are sinful, it's a temptation, 
yes, maybe there is that element, but why? Why it is like that? So even, so this is why even the, even a practice of renunciation is always accompanied by the four truths, four noble truths. Even the breathing, for instance, right? Like when you are doing the shamatha vipassana, you are supposed to be aware of breathing. And the first lesson probably you will re receive is just be aware of breathing. Don't think about good, bad. Don't judge. Just know the breathing. That actually is already a bit of a prajna, already. Very, very, very kindergarten level of prajna, but it is because the moment you think about it, it's a harsh breathing, it's a soft breathing, it's a this breathing, that breathing, then you are going away from the prajna. You are making, you are telling stories, you are creating a lot of myth. Now, just, I'm breathing. It's out, now it's in, now it's out, now it's in, just that. That already involves the Four Noble Truths. And these are what is actually taught, especially in the Abhidharma. Well, again, I have to tell you this. There's just too many things to, I don't know, share. Um, when I talk about Abhidharma, I have to confess, I have to admit, I am talking very much based on what is written by um, Papa Yingyan, Vasu, Vasubandhu. Vasubandhu. Pakistani, right? Is that okay? I tell you this. <laughs> Pakistani. Pakistani. Right? Isn't it? Isn't he? Pakistani? I think so. He would be holding a Pakistani passport this day if he's alive. No? Is he Pakistani? Well, you don't have to admit it openly. <laughs> His work. I actually studied the root text by heart. The Abhi, um, Abhidharma Gosha. Uh, but that's just a very small portion of the Abhidharma. There is um, Abhidharma very Jada Shenzo Chenmo. Do you know how to say this in Jada You know the grand Abhidharma text written by Arhats. Those are later. Basically, Vasubandhu sort of essentialized. So, right? so I have to say here that there's a lot of chauvinism involved. You know, we are human, human beings. So there's always a male chauvinism, Mahayana chauvinism, Tantrika chauvinism, and then the Tibetan chauvinism. So all of this has deprived ourselves from studying other resources. But supposedly we have transcended, we have become much more globalized and internationalized and sophisticated. So actually the Buddhists Currently, we should really explore the study of Abhidharma that's found in Sri Lanka, Burma. I really encourage this if, you, if there are Abhidharma fanatics here. Okay. For now, towards what? Towards... Okay, let's open the, pan, what do you call it? Pandora box. Towards Tharva Tang Thamji Chamber. Tharva, Moksha. And Thamji Chamber, what do you, hmm? Yeah, sort of omniscience we are talking about. So, liberations and omniscience. Now, this word, liberation and omniscience. That is very, very Mahayana language, by the way. 
because okay, this is important that you need, you you make note. We are okay. One would think, oh, liberation that will suffice, right? Why do we need omniscience here? You know, isn't just a, another hardship? You know, why do we need that? Just to get the hell out of here. That's all we need. Mm, no. Because, yeah, especially according, from the Mahayana point of view, they said you need omniscience. Let's not go into this too deep right now. But anyway, liberation. Liberation from what? Entanglement and um, entanglement with the, uh, you know, illusion, thinking that they are real. Basically, that's what it is. That's samsara. So really, we need to really, yeah, so it's, I, I don't want to use words like enlightenment, even though we, we may end up using it. Just keep in mind the, the whole idea of, why we go towards, towards the truth is because we wish to liberate ourselves from the entanglement toward, uh, yeah, entanglement with um, um, this uh, thinking illusion is real and therefore, con uh, you know, endlessly going through dukkha, pain, dissatisfaction, and um, okay, so on and so forth. Okay, you know, because of the age, my memory is not so good. So when it is in my head, I better spit it out. Otherwise, I will forget. Earlier, I mentioned to you, but my tantrika, my tantric teachers told me. Actually, they you know implore they, you know like I have to study my, uh, abhidharma to study tan tantra. So I'm sure you may want to know why. What's tantra got to do with this? A lot. Hopefully we will reach to this, but as I said, Abhidharma is very big. One of, okay. For instance, one of the big subjects of the Abhidharma study is uh, study of Zuk, Zuk, Rupa, translating, how do you translate? Form? Form, I guess. Form. Oh, it's a really big... What is form? How do you define a form? I'm telling you, these are thought through by the Indians 3,000 years ago. What, what is a form? How do you define a form? And how many types of forms are there? So on and so forth. Okay? So there's that. So this is an important study for the Tantra because, okay, very, very loosely, I will go very quickly. The form, when, when form is studied in the Abhidharma, based on the Vabhyashika school of Buddhism, which has a great, great authority in the study of Abhidharma, by the way, actually, Abhidharma study has a lot of influence from the Vabhyashika, Swatantrika, and uh, Chittamata. The three schools that the Tibetans have kind of managed to forget very stupidly, actually, I, I should say. Such a good three schools. So, just give you an example. Form. What is form? If you ask a Vabeshika, they have like incredible categories and explanations. 
Okay, anyway. So, Babeshika people talk about particles, right? Very, 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 basically they're a bit like a today's, what do you call it? Atom, atomic theorist, you know, that every, you know, atoms, small particles. So they talk about like that. That's how the Buddhists used to, I mean, the, one of the Buddhist school used to speak. How, how do you define a form? And talking about atoms and how the atoms creates the form. And then, of course, the mind is important. Because if there is no mind, who knows what is form? So on and so forth. Okay, fast forward all the way to Tantra. So what is that? What is those atoms? Oh, the tantric bliss, oh, nothing. They're all darkness. You understand? See? So for the tantra, study of Abhidhamma becomes very, very important. How does the darkness function? How does the, uh, the element, you know, these five Buddha functions? How the deities, deities is not the right word, deva, how do you translate? I mean, I know so many people will just shun all those Indians, all they think about is elephant god, the monkey god, this god, that god, you know, female god, god with a thousand arms, two arms. But those have a, such a profound background. Go back to my example. You just dreamt that you drank poison and you refuse to believe that this is a dream. How do you talk to you? I have to talk to you with a figures like black woman with a tongue sticking out. I have to. That's the only way. Right? So that's where all this amazing manifestations of devas, devis, and the rituals, the fire pujas, all this really. If you, if you understand that the tantric way of thinking, you can appreciate a most sort of sophisticated laboratory in MIT and a one morning's fire puja equal. It's a really a amazing process and uh, act of, I don't know, you know, like trying to find the truth. And plus, without spending any money, actually. I just wanted to tell you this, because... I, mm, <clears throat> okay, so... Ngan, the word ngan, towards the truth. I think this will do for now. Okay, let's, because there's many, many other definitions of the word abhi. Um, we can, if you want, I mean, if you want, not only just if you want, but if I remember and if I know, we can probably discuss about the word ngan, abhi, in a, with a, other definitions. It's, you know, the Sanskrit and Pali language, these are really rich language. I mean, the word dharma has like something like 10 meanings, right? And some of them are very, very connected. The others are not really connected, but, you know. Um... I think it's in actually here. We talked about Tathagata, right? Way of the Tathagatas. And remember, we talked about the word, you know, Tathagata. Um, and in Sanskrit, and I guess it's in Bali too, the word come and go are some, somehow kind of the same thing. Come and go. 
thought of the same thing. This is the richness. Okay. Now, so that's, so bear, you have to bear with me that yes, we are doing the glimpse of Abhidharma and there is going to be a lot of term. I will try to sort of, I was told there's a lot of sort of beginners, so for your sake, I will try to sort of make it accessible, but it's difficult. Okay, now, um, let's go to something very big concerning Abhidharma. Let's go right into something big. Sakchedan Same. My Sakche. <clears throat> Before I say it in English, I'm going to try the Sanskrit word. Ash Sarshapa, right? Hmm. How do you translate that into English? Try, let's see. Contaminated phenomena? So you don't, so we don't pronounce the word ah, right? We don't pronounce the word ah? Srava, 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 Asar, Asrava, Asrava, Srava. So we do not pronounce, right? Okay. Um, very cop out way of translating this is what? Defilement, emotion? Defilement? Hmm? Defilement, right? But let's be a little bit more specific because I think it would, I should give you the picture. What does that mean? Because the moment I use the word defilement, I know your brain, your pre programmed brain is already thinking. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a mm, AI thing, what, chat something, GT, what? Chat G. So far, it failed me a lot, by the way. <laughs> but when I go through that, actually, I had some concern. You can try this later. But anyway, Sakche which is asrav, asrava in Sanskrit. Very, very important subject to study. Okay, the Tibetan, they really translated well, I think. I think they did a good job. Sakche, the word sakche is a, such a beautiful word. It is part of the word Kang sa. Kang means full, sa means sort of leak. Actually, shit also. Not sort of wasted. Okay? Wasted, sort of. Also, it has a connotation of running, running, flowing, discharge, emission. I think these are good words to, un to make note when we study transgressing. 
So <clears throat> Abhidharma, basically Abhidharma, when the Abhidharma look at the world and the life, I'm trying to make it relevant for us. When the Abhidharma look at the life and the, and the world, Abhidharma sort of categorize the world or the life in two. One that is leaking, the other that is not leaking. Leak, flowing, running. Um, one that discharge and one that does not discharge. And this is a very, very big, sub, big part of the Abhidharma study. Um, among many other things, the word, this word, asavara, asrava, it also has the connotation of um, falling, falling. So, okay, so let's make it very practical. The moment right now, you and I, whatever we do, the moment we think of something, it's bound to fall. It's bound to discharge. Um, Okay, so at glance you may think, okay, and that's kind of simple, right? I mean, is that what we study in the Abhidharma? No, not just that. I just give you a very, very general meaning of what word asarva means. This gets much more complicated. And I wanted to share this with you, just also as sort of like to be... Um, okay, so this sarva is, has a three categories, There's so many categories now. Um, one is Ndebisakwa, Ndebisakwa is like, um, Anything I think what I was just telling you earlier, like the moment we think, the moment we eat, that's going to be falling, discharging opinion, values. All these are a sarva. It's going to be. By the way, it's a little bit different from impermanence also. It has, of course, the character of the impermanence, but we are talking much, much more. We will get, get to this. Now, there is another asarva, which is very, very uh, sophisticated, which is Sibisakwa. Sibisakwa is like a asarva or the discharge of existence. This is a, yeah, a difficult one. Hmm? 
Bava, Bava, right. Okay. What is the example of that? And the, <clears throat> you know, we do vipassana, shamatha vipassana, and you become so good at absorption. You really, you know, you really begin to uh, become very, very. <clears throat> Okay, you, you, you become free from lots of this gross asarva, gross discharge, gross falling, gross um, um, Deforming, deform, decay. Because, you know, you are reaching to a certain stage of absorption that is so kind of freed from many of these outer cause and conditions. So you may almost think that you have managed to in, unentangle yourself, unentangle yourself from the, this delusion of thinking and illusion is real. But according to the Abhidharma, no. You are still within the category of Sakpa Asava. So this is a this is a very difficult, um, it's, a, it's a quite a difficult subject to study, but I think it's a very, very um, important uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it relevant for today. Okay, so I think for today, in the today's world, we, some of us, not all, I mean, most majority of the people, we are so looking for distractions, right? Looking for distractions. We can't have enough distractions. We buy distractions. We get, we subscribe to the dis distractions. Um, we insert dis distractions. We need to. Yeah, we need to be distracted. But a few of us, we realize that the distractions actually ends up making you a slave to the, that very distractions. Subsequently, you become um, dependent to the core, uh, to the, this distractions and it's, it's a, uh, sort of um, other cause and conditions. In other words, addictions. So therefore, many of us, I mean, not the majority, we spend time in contemplation such as shamatha, such as vipassana. And then, um, we feel free from entanglement to distractions. But then, this freedom itself ends up becoming a taste. It ends up becoming a very, very sophisticated distractions. And that is what is being taught in the Abhidharma. Really, really high level of mental state. So this is why I was talking earlier. Today, we are talking about mental health, psychotherapy, and all of this. We are talking on the very, very ground level. So in other words, what I'm saying is those who have graduated 
from the those who have perfected and graduated from University of Vipassana to, after 12 years, they need another kind of psychotherapy. They need another kind of healing because that state is asarva. That state cheats. That state falls. That state decays. And anything that has, this is why in the, <clears throat> uh, what do you call it, for um, hallmark of Buddha Dharma, we say, Satchitamji Dunghalvavo, that all asarva is dukkha. All, um, I think, I, I usually say all emotions are pain, but that's really, really badly put. Now, today we are talking in a much more sort of um, refined and uh, much more um, concentrated way. Okay, so this is just a very, very small introduction. And then Just to give you a picture, the first asarva, the asarva of kamma, which is the, um, you know, this world. According to the Abhidharma, there's a 360 different categories of mental factors. That is what is studied in the Abhidharma. So you can see, it's a really, really important study of psychology, biology, um, I would say, you know, mind and the body and the world. Because when, when the Buddhists study about the mind, when Buddhists study mind, they do not really isolate the outer world, and in-between world, because they're so connected. And then, the third sakva, or the asadva, is, I think, usually what the Buddhists talk about, ignorance. Anything that has an ignorance. Now that can get really, really com complicated and very, very subtle. Like if you go all the way to the Tantra. So yeah, I want to bring the Tantra here just to give you the picture. The Tantric would say, even if you think that there is a something called a samsara and the nirvana, samsara to get rid of and nirvana to obtain, you have this third asarva you are shitting, you are falling, you are decaying, you are subject of decay, you are subject of falling, you are subject of I know this is getting really technical, but Within this asarva, even the great bodhisattvas meditative, bodhisattvas and the arhats, maybe not the arhat, but stream winner, the, you know, all the stages of, um, stages towards the arhat, many of their meditative states are all asarva. Even, even, even the, because they are subject of decay. So that's sort of the, what do you call it? Glimpse of Asarva. Maybe we should take a break after this, don't you think? It's like too much. I'm confused myself now. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <clears throat>
What is the equivalent word in Pali, Sasarva and Asasarva? Anasarva. Without. Same During the break, I was talking to some of my old Indian friends, and I'm a little bit surprised that um, this, the very terminology is not that known in the, with the Indian. That is not good. <laughs> yes, yes, this is, they should. I think, because it is really important. I'm talking about how it's really important for everything. Parenting, geopolitic, I don't know, uh, international relationship, uh, metaverse, um, black pink phenomena. Really, it is very important to understand the, this sasarva and asasarva, which is... Um, and because of that, I was thinking, I need to really, again, once again, try to sort of present this. But, uh, but uh, for those who are not used to this, I understand it's kind of um, difficult to initially hear it and... But um, if, you pay, if you put some effort, it's a really, really um, important way to look at the world and the life. Not just big way, but even a cup of tea. Um, I think the word contaminated is good to translate the word um, sasarva, contaminated probably defiled, contaminated. So to explain this once again, let me go back to my uh, example I was giving you. And this example that I was giving you, I, I'm, I was quoting from a tan tantric text. And since I see a lot of tantric practitioners and students and also Mahayana, probably it will be easier for you to relate and then you can actually go to the real foundation of the Abhidharma study. It's really important. Okay, um, I'm jumping everywhere, so. Uh, look, okay, so for instance, like a vip uh, vipassana. Um, let's say as a vipassana practitioner will um, begin with looking at the body, right? Let's say mindfulness of the body. But mindfulness of the body, just like, okay, I'm raising my hand, am I raising my hand, my, I'm putting it down, I'm putting it down, I'm now like this, I'm, that's just a very, very kindergarten level. What we are really trying to decipher is and they are monks. I have met them in Burma. I have to say, this was one of my greatest memory of my life. I went to Burma something like 30 years ago, and I volunteered. I was incognito. I volunteered to do something for this Vipassana Center. And they asked me to chop um, cabbage. There was something like about two, three hundred monks and participants, and it was so tough to chop cabbage for like hours and hours. It was so painful, you know, being spoiled as a Rinpoche for a long time. <laughs> anyway, it was only like two, three hours of chopping vegetable in the morning. That's it. The rest is do whatever I want. But anyway, there are monks not only monks, practitioners, lay people. They have trained so much, when they look at the body, they only relate to the body in parts. 
you know, like, no, I'm not only talking about finger, you know, skin, blood, nail. Some of these guys are looking at the world as atom. See, that is what, that is our, yeah, that is uncontaminated. They are reaching, they are, they are going there. It's not the complete, you know, it's not complete uncontaminated, but it's on the way. Us, you and me, we don't even think in terms of finger, nail, we don't. We just think so stupidly and ridiculously some whole unit called me. Whatever that means, I am here. Look, which part? We don't think like that. We just think like a lump of meat, a lump. That's how we think. That is like a, like, really, really, really contaminated. So, when you look at the world with that kind of contamination, now imagine how things can go wrong. So, somebody who look at your, your world as this one unit, and then you read New York Times or listen to BBC, how are you going to hear it? Versus a Burmese monk who look at their life as finger, as nose, as lips, and even more subtle as particles. They read New York Times or listen to BBC. It's different. See, you are looking at the... So this is actually this is actually a very important, not just term, but categorization of mental or psychological. It's not psychology and that, that's a very gross categorization. But Abhidharma, for this, out of compassion, the Buddha taught Abhidharma, and the way he present is these two, you know, contaminated and uncontaminated. Okay, so let me use the example that, the tantric example I was just giving you earlier. So, you dreamt that you just drank a poison. What is the most, what is the most complete, uncontaminated. The fact that you, in reality, you didn't drink poison. That is it. Now, if you are smart and you are calm and you are brave, somebody tells you, relax, you just drank, I mean, you just dreamt. Then, that will suffice, but, this is important to make note, the fact that you need to hear somebody saying, relax, that's actually in the category of sarab. It's, it's mixed, by the way, you see? So this is why um, in the Mahayana, uh, you know, you know, more the path becomes more sophisticated, the way they define what is contaminated and what is contaminated also becomes more sophisticated. And yes, understanding this contaminated world and uncontaminated world, not just theoretically, but Um, practically and habituating oneself with this kind of understanding. Of course, 
first through hearing, secondly through contemplation, and then finally really habituating oneself, seeing this way. And you can, you can. It's just you don't pay, you, you don't pay that much energy. I, I love always giving this example. I'm sure many of you are tired of this example. I used to have an assistant who was, who was a biochemist, what do you call it, virologist, whatever. And um, she's really very experienced. I mean, she learned the highest level of this virus stuff. And she travels with hand sanitizer all the time. I mean, this is way before the pandemic, 20 years ago. Because in her trained and habituated mind, everywhere she sees, you know, I'm looking at the most clean cup, and she has to wash it about 21 times <laughs> in different stages, finally with a sanitizer. Because her, she has trained to see it as a virus. And that must have taken, yeah, you know, so you can train through hearing, contemplation, and meditation. You can. So if you can try to see the world through this kind of category, you know, Abhidharma is not like some hobby-oriented text, you know. It's not like what the Indian Panditas used to say. I think India used to, you know, India was a really, really rich in this way. I guess during the Vasubandhu's time, there were other scholars who wrote books about whether the crows have teeth or not. And he blatantly refuted those things. That who cares whether the crows have teeth or not? These are useless texts. So what if the crow has teeth or not. Because what we really need to understand is the truth. And the way to decipher this truth is by categorization, like how the Abhidharma is doing. Okay. Mm. There will be a lot of terminology, epistemology, Okay, so as I said, um, I have, you know, most of what I'm going to sort of share, very little, by the way, just because of my capacity, my ability um, of Abhidharma. Um, so let's... Um, Let's now elaborate a little bit the contaminated world, okay? So then this one has uh, several things, okay? Um, skandhas. How do you translate the skandhas in English? Aggregates and... Um, uh, kam, which is uh, datu, translated as 
sphere, realm, what do you, realm, datus, and then chemche ayatanas, which is translated as, yeah? Chem, kham is sphere, right? Element, okay, chemche. Um, <clears throat> Wow, again, I have to just say this while it's in my head. The come, the datu, study of the datu. It's really, really powerful. You know, one good example is this, I think. Some of those people who so-called, uh, they call liberals, they have what I call liberal datu. They will never ever hear. They will never hear comments like, hey, you know, being liberal actually means being fundamentalist. They will think, what are you talking about? And then, of course, the vice versa, fundamentalist, that's just a cum. It's a datu. Can you see now why Abhidharma is a, such an important study? Because it really, really <laughs> talks about datu and the skandhas and the ayatanas. And it, then, of course, and then, of course, if we have time, we will also go through le, which is karma, action, and hopefully we can also have some discussions about how the other schools they understand the karma. I was reading uh, President of India, Radha Krishna. He was talking about the karma as, you know, like something to do with the playing cards. Like once you have the, what do you call it, hand, and then you are stuck with it, you know, then you only can sort of mani manipulate whatever you have. Mm. Tantricas don't understand like that. Tantricas will say, you have the right not to play or play. That is the destroyer of all the karma. The real manipulator of the karma is the right to play or not. By the time you talk about already what's in your hand, it's too late. That's like already, you have already got into it. Hopefully, we will remember to come to the karma. But um, skandhas, it's a big subject. Let's begin with the skandha. Mm. Just very briefly, because this is a big subject, you can't carry, you can't complete everything. And some of this we may come back again, you know, to discuss um, so that we can tie it up. Because they are also very connected. Um, they are all very connected. Okay. In order, before we talk about the skandhas, datus, and the ayatanas, again, once again, we, we, can't, you know, we can't help, but we need to talk about the truth. I told you, the Indians were so obsessed with this. At least the so-called, uh, you know, like Buddhist, so-called 
Jane and so called what um, Nyayas and Purva Mimamsas and all of this. They were so, and rightfully so. And really, I appreciate so much that they were obsessed because they, it's just incredible. And in the process, they talked about relative truth and ultimate truth, which you know many of the Buddhists here would know what you know, sort of at least that categorization, relative truth and ultimate truth. And then of course the presentation of the relative truth and ultimate truth differs with the different schools or different tradition. Here, for now, let us use what one of the tradition, Vabhyashika Buddhist school, how they present very briefly. Anything that can be deconstructed, I'll put it in a very, very crude way, okay? Anything that can be deconstructed is a relative truth, and anything that cannot be deconstructed is the ultimate truth. Very, very scientific, I would say. So, like cup, you can break. Then it will become a piece of cup. This you can also break. Then it will become a you know, part of the broken cup. This also you can break all the way down to the most smallest part, particle. And this, by the time this one that cannot be deconstructed anymore is the ultimate, that's the ultimate. Very, very, I would say, materialistic, uh, what do you call it, scientists. I think a lot of today's modern scientists would be very comfortable with this Buddhist school. And then there are other Buddhist schools, Swatrantika and the Chittamata school. They don't agree with this, of course. They say that, you know, that, you know, like, Deconstruction, you know, the mainly what they are saying is by, by the time, um, as long as there is a deconstructor, there is a subject involved. And the subject, right, so anything, you see, this is why the word, um, you know, contempt, you know, as long as the, there is a duality between subject and object, it becomes a contaminated world. Let's go back to the contaminated. Okay. Um, but, so that's, that's how, that's how, what is it? Um, that's how, uh, what do you call it? That's how the Vabhyashika school defined the red, ultimate truth and the relative truth. Okay, just, just to give you a, because I, you know, since this is an open public situation, I can't of course give you the tantrika's idea of relative truth and ultimate truth, you know, in the complete sense. But just briefly, the tantrikas would say something like this. Anything, anything that is pure, pure in the sense of no extremes, no black, no pure of the black, pure of the white, pure of small, pure of big, anything that is pure is ultimate truth, and anything that is equal is relative truth. They don't even say anything that is impure is a relative truth. They say equality is a relative truth, and purity is the ultimate truth. That's how they, so what, some of the tantra is also, lit, you know, it's a very big subject, but that's how they say Eco, equanimity and uh, purity. But let's, this is just to give you the idea of relative truth and ultimate truth. And when we study Buddhist philosophy, this is important. And 
every devotee, I'm not talking about academic students, the actual devotees, those who follow this path, they usually have two fear. They are scared of two things. What are they scared of? Um, <clears throat> They are, they are scared of exaggeration during the ultimate truth. Just write it down, doesn't matter, in your mind. Exaggeration of the ultimate truth. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means something like this. Ultimately, God exists. Buddhists are so afraid of telling these things. That's an exaggeration. That's what they will think. Ultimately, somebody, somebody exaggerated, you know, like created. So they're afraid of meaning exaggerate, fabricate. They're so afraid of fabricating on the ultimate truth. Okay? Kunzaptu, kurbadep. This, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, they are afraid of underestimation of relative truth. What does that mean? Oh, reincarnation, that's just a mumbo jumbo. Deva, that's mumbo jumbo. Mm, the, the Buddhist will say, not really. God exists just as how a head exists on your neck. You know, there's a head on our neck. If head exists on your neck, God also exists. But do you want to decipher and deconstruct? Of course not. Head, what is head? It's not one unit, it's skin, it's a nose, it's ear. Then you can't find. Just like that, God does not exist. Yeah? So they are all, so they, these, the, the devotees are usually afraid of two things, exaggeration of, during the ultimate truth and underestimation during the relative truth. And this is a way I really think, this is one of the way Indian used to think. They are so, so used to think like that at least in the past. So you see, when, when somebody like, um, Richard Dawkins, is it? Who, who said, uh, who talked about uh, Big Bang? Who, who termed the word Big Bang? Quantum theory? Stephen Hawkins? Stephen Hawkins, is it? Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. The moment when Buddhists hear the word like Big Bang, they are trained to think when? Big Bang on the ultimate level or relative level? You understand? If you say, oh, Big Bang is like a relative level, ah, no problem. Just as your head on your head on your neck and the Shiva floating around the Pune sky, you know, Tara Devi, you know, in the some Buddhist shrine. Big Bang can somewhere float around in on the sky of Cambridge. No problem. We have no problem with that. But ultimately, if you are talking about a Big Bang, ah, now we have to think about this. Because you are exaggerating, exaggerating. You understand? This is how the Buddhists used, I mean, the Indians. I think this is a very classic Indian way of thinking. So, you, okay, so anyway, I've, that's just a brief introduction to how the two truths, how the 
truth is being approached using the, the sort of the way categorization of ultimate truth and the relative truth. Now let's go to the skanda. So, I mean, um, so skanda, the meaning of the skanda, pung po, which is um, piled up, right? Piled, piled, put it together. Put it together. Now, pungpo, put together. Skanda. I don't know whether this resonate, this word skanda. You see, in the ordinary people like you and me, when you hear the word pung, meaning aggregate, piled up, you may be thinking in terms of like construction, construction, but you never think about deconstructions simultaneously. For instance, see, I'm showing you the cup, but I'm piling this up now here. It has deconstructed the or original shape. You understand? See, this is the shape now. I'm piling up like this, and it has deconstructed. This is how the Buddhists look at the skanda. Form, feeling, perception, consciousness is always piling up at the same time, deconstructing. Good news and bad news together. If the good news is piling. You understand? It depends, right? It's subjective. It's very subjective, isn't it? If you like to pile up, like if you are like, what do you call it? Rat, pack rat? What do you call it? Rat, pack, pack rat? Like my suitcase, basically. You know, just like piling up, piling up. Then maybe piling up is a good news. If you're of... Like... Um, You know, some of those failed um, nihilist, atheist, Zen Buddhist, then you probably are more inclined with the uh, uh, opposite of piling up. What is that? Like, there are professions in Japan. Do you know that? They come to your home and throw things out. <laughs> what, what do you call them? I, I'm serious. You should consider this job. <laughs> hmm? There is a job, right? There is a job in Japan or elsewhere too. They come to you. You can call up. My room is so messy and I'm, I'm like, I have no space. Can you come? And they will come and throw things out. And you pay them a lot of money. This is, you know, I, I'm, it, it may sound like a joke, but actually, that's what is happening all the time. Even as you, even as you read a book, there's a, comp there's a piling up and de depiling, so to speak. So when I, take, when I talk to you about the skanda, you really need to think in terms of not just one side of piling, piling, and putting up together, but it's also changing. It's shifting. It's like a sand dune. It's like, and it's so, in a way, it's like, I was talking to some, what did they call it? Like the computer science, uh, engineering. Uh, you know, the, we were talking about AI, artificial intelligence. People who are involved with this, and I was saying that if the robot has this element of when we put program. 
one part of their situation, whether it changes or not, and it has to change. If all this come together, and if they have the five skandhas, and then if they have a mindset of thinking that this is me, they are a sentient being. No problem with that one. But anyway, that's just um, another time conversation. So, um, well, skandhas have form, feeling, perception, action, consciousness. I don't know whether you have thought about this. You know, people talk about mental health. How many of these people who talk about mental health talk about five skandhas? If they are not talking about five skandhas, they are not even this close to the mental health situation. It's so important, this five skandha. Yeah, of course, you can understand a little bit with form. Yes, you know, obviously, if somebody pinch my, you know, body, you know, and then maybe, yeah, the form, but not too fast, not too fast. Um, even the form. Okay, I will throw in one very, very, uh, <laughs> what do you call it, a term that is, that is really going to throw you out of this world, especially those who are new. Then min duje jizuk. Number rigje maim bizuk. How do you translate that one? Um, then mean, you know, like, number rigje maim bizuk. You know, there is a, supposedly, there is a, there is a form <clears throat> In the, anyway, the Abhidharma talks about another form that is, n that is not at all like this form that we see. Okay, I, I, I will save this for maybe um, tomorrow or day after tomorrow. But anyway, so to understand the form itself, Mm. It's quite quite big, and then of course the feeling. We sort of know a little bit about feeling of pain, a little bit, and that because of that we may understand a little bit about feeling of what bliss, sort of devadang dunghal. Yeah, but. We have no clue about Srotangham. Upeksha, yeah, right. Like, how do you translate that in English? Economy? Neutral? Yes. Without pain, without pleasure. Wow, this is an important one, again. Okay, let me be a little bit of a Buddhist chauvinist here once. This is what the Buddhist chauvinists usually say. Pain, pain, even the ordinary people don't want. There's nothing so great about of not wanting to suffer. Ah, look, this is ordinary people also don't want to suffer. Okay, so that's one, one feeling. Next is bliss. That ordinary people want. But non-Buddhists, you know, like in 
in this case, I think the Buddhists are referring to like Jain and Nyaya and Purva Mimamsa. I'm talking about really like a Buddhist now. Even these people, even this really, if these religious people, they want to also get rid of this feeling, feeling of bliss. But the one who wish to renounce the neutral feeling, only the Buddhist. That's what the Buddhist chauvinist would say. Of course, you can argue with me if you are a, if you are a follower of Jain, especially. I, I have a feeling that Jain talks similar, but you know, sometimes the Buddhists don't give us proper information. <laughs> I have to be careful here. There's so many Jain or ex-Jain. They may feel very, you know, And Buddhists are very, very, very threatened by the neutral feeling. Buddhists are the most, I mean, Buddhists are least threatened by the painful feeling because that, you know, obviously everybody doesn't want it. We don't have to talk about it too much. But not one that you should renounce the feeling of bliss, yeah, that one you have to put some effort. But <laughs> not wanting to feel neutral feeling, whoa, that one requires a bit of effort. 99.99.99.99 Vipassana practitioners are craving for this neutral feeling. They think this is nirvana. I'm telling you. Might as well put a big anesthesia. Anesthesia, you know? That's what Buddhists think. It's like so dangerous. Numb feeling. And this is a one big subject in the Abhidharma. And it's a really, really important because <clears throat> also this is a big, big argument between the Buddhists and many, many other schools. And the arguments are very interesting because Buddhists are always saying, hey, 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 your meditation that you do, it's only going to take you to that neutral feeling. And this is dangerous because your karma and your contaminated phenomena are there in the waiting room. As soon as there's an announcement for your what wait listed, they will just come. That's what the Buddhists think. Do you think they, I should, oh, it's only like 10 minutes. Do you want to ask a question regarding, is there, is, should we? But, but we are also coming back, right? Like, when, when, like uh, what time? Three to four. You can also, maybe we can do the, uh, you know, um, if you have uh, questions during three to four, because after the um, Rajasthani Thali <laughs> and Abhidharma subjects such as Ayatanas and Datus and Skandhas, probably we should do the question and answer during that time. But um, um, just let me finish this one ten, in 10 minutes. Okay. Skandhas. I just told you Skanda has what? This piling up 
and in the process of piling up, it's changing the shape, it's changing its original. That's just one aspect of skanda. Skanda is a real bad news, by the way. Another, another reason why it's a bad news. It's a bit like China and America. They hate each other, but they have to rely on each other. It's like a bad marriage. You understand? You can't, you can't, you know, you can't, you know, like get rid of the other because if you get rid of the other one, you also crumble. So anything to do with the skanda is like this. It's basically, just imagine some impossible bad character people put together, five of them, I mean, not only five, actually I'm only talking about one skanda, let's just talk one skanda, form, rupa. Even the making of this rupa, each element are just impossible beings, I mean impossible characters, they each have their character. One likes tea, the other likes coffee, the one likes, you know, Indian food, too much spice, one likes, one likes, one loves spice, all put together. Result, imagine, they are not going to last long. Divorce already, <laughs> you know, <laughs> guaranteed, <laughs> right from the beginning. This is what we are talking about, our form. This form that is seemingly at the moment intact, Look at just this. It's a disaster. It's a bad news. Every particle of this, they are like impossible. They are like Putin, Bush, all put into a small box and say, okay, you work out something, okay? It's a bit like this. You work out something out of this. It's a bit like that. That's, that's one of the connotations of the skanda. Can you, can, can you imagine? Okay, wait. Another one. There's a many, by the way. These are the study of the Abhidharma, by the way. Okay, one more. One more. There is this big illusion, you know, pile up, pile up. It creates this illusion that they have become one. You understand what I mean? But they are never one. Never. But it's just ridiculous that we think they are one. This is how sad it is. It's like me looking at you guys and think that there's only one human being. You understand what I mean? Each and every one of them. But then it creates, it, it's so smart actually. Skandas are smart. They make you believe that they are one. Like form, trupa. This is why the moisturizing companies are making money. Because there's this illusion is just one. Because you understand, but it's it's just like a there's a lot of examples like this, um, like a flock of bird creates this picture of one big dark whatever. You know, it's a bit like that. They're, so the fact that they are not in parts. I mean, the fact that there's no such thing as one unit, unit. How do you define the word, English word unit? Unit, unit, what is unit? Can you define? Unit. Hmm? Group? Ten, one group. Yeah, 
Yeah, but now, as, even as you explained to me, you can see this is a total, you know, false, isn't it? There is no such thing as that. So, it's like this. So now you look at things like systems, political systems, whatever, doesn't matter. It's systems are all like that. Okay, one more. There's many, many more. Can't finish everything. So many more. Okay, another one about the skanda. Why it is a bad news. And this is a big one, by the way. This is a really big one. These skandhas, they are subject to time. This is the most dep depressing one. If only one of them is not subject of time, you are very well in a, in a good position, but none of them is independent from, sub, you know, independent from time. They are all under the wrath of the Lord Yama, the time. And of course, we can always sugarcoat them with things like, oh, progress development, increasing, <laughs> you know, you can always sugarcoat with these things, but nevertheless, do you know by the time when you, sorry to say this, but when you finish your graduation, means you have become old. You know, you have now, you know, you have become old. I mean, then you will miss those kindergarten days. See? So, you <clears> eat <throat> There is. <sighs> okay, one more. And this is maybe um, um, Judah, cause. They each have a different cause, their own cause, independent. What does that mean? Why is it a bad news? Because you could be shaking hand with the front one, whoever is in front, the skanda, but this skanda is very much not shaking hand with the other one. You understand? So there's a complication. Basically, we are talking about the complication. It's so complicated. This is why the life has become like a playing billiard. Billiard? You want to hit the white ball, but then it also has to hit the red ball. And then you have to deal with that situation. So life just ends up becoming dealing with the situation, dealing with the situation, dealing with the situation. Okay. Uh, It's just too many. I don't know which one to choose now. Maybe in Doha, transmigration, transmigration, Doha. How do you trans how do you say it in samsara? You know, like lok. Yeah? How do you trans? Yeah, Kati. Basically, all these skandhas, not just in lump, not just, just in unit, each particle, they're all passengers, passengers. They're all waiting, they're waiting for their flight, and they're all looking for the boarding gate. Passengers? Some of them miss flight. Others' flights are delayed. Others are waitlisted. 
but basically ndoa is such a beautiful word how can oh indians you have to really treasure these such a beautiful word gati oh my goodness gati ndoa ndoa gati what a beautiful word that's how these people they look at the world as the passengers draw 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 means walking traveling travelers travelers voyagers voyagers each each particles each and every come and datu and ayatana they are all passengers voyagers and most of them have no clues of destination they only have imaginary destinations like you understand like made up destinations because you know why because whatever they have the destination they are themselves kandas so they are themselves moving so let's say at least when you be, if you fly from pune to bom what uh, pune to delhi you can fly this direction is it sort of <laughs> and then you reach there right but the problem is the doa the gati the samsara is you fly and the delhi is also moving <laughs> you understand <laughs> so <laughs> the traveler is moving the destination is moving this is how the abhi dharma people see the world you now see the importance of the study of the abhi dharma anyway let's take break for lunch